Welcome to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn. This is Simon Provan. Good evening to you, Simon. How are you tonight, sir? I'm doing great, especially since we already have people on Periscope tweeting in things like, is Bradley posh enough yet? (laughs) He's not in the Premier League yet, so no, obviously he's not (laughs) posh enough yet, but don't jump ahead of the story. Don't jump ahead of what we're talking about. Good Lord. People on Periscope and Simon are revolting against me already, and we haven't even done the introductions yet. Holy cow. Anyway, well, good evening and good afternoon to all of you that are tuning in to another edition of Two Up Front that she's brought to you by Sports Radio America. We just want to remind all of you that you can listen to this wonderful show from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern on SportsRadioAmerica.com on Friday afternoons. You can also get us on Live 365 and tune in and on demand on iHeartRadio, iTunes, and on Spreaker.com and on Periscope as well. Yes, sir. How was your weekend? My weekend was very busy. I had a broadcast Friday night. I had a broadcast Saturday. I sang at church on Sunday, watched the Packer game, and then collapsed Sunday night. Yeah, good, good. How about you? What did you do? I had... uh what did I do this weekend? I, I did something. Are you busy being famous again? Well, no, that's that's this coming weekend. Oh. The film that we were both in, Baxter. Yes. Uh, being aired in a nice big uh, movie theater. Fun fact. So I'll be Fun watching fact. that. Um, no, today, though. Today. What is today? Today uh, is uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Hump I've, day. I've put on 250 miles on my car today. My driving goodness. Driving down to Chicago and back and picking up a daughter from... Uh, musical rehearsal and driving back here to be able to do our show. So, well, I appreciate your dedication to the show, Simon. Uh, that means a likewise, lot. Likewise, likewise. No, absolutely. But that's I mean, why I can't remember what I did this weekend. I'm still on. You're still trying to today. figure out today, yeah? Because you were in the big city of Chicago today, and then you were all over the place. Did you stop by Chicago? You know, Chicago Fire, apply for a new job, uh, maybe wish, take their head yeah. coaching. You know, I did not. I did not. Mm, you could yeah. be like, I got this. Right. I got this. <laughs> I, I think you could. I think you'd probably do just fine. I don't know. I don't know. I could We're be. I could be like that fan that sent in uh, his letter to Liverpool, talking about how awesome he did on FIFA. Hey, that's a that was a very difficult thing that he had to do. I forget the team that he took. I think it was Portsmouth or something like that. Something, that he, yeah. yeah, that's not one Champions League. With he did. Him. He did in four years. That's right. that's not an easy feat to do. So you know that man has a lot of credentials going for him. But anyway, so. Uh, we do also have credentials on social media as well, Simon, which uh, are all over the place, aren't they we? They are. On Facebook, we are Two Up Front. On Twitter, we are at Two Up Front Soccer. Instagram, we are at Two Up Front Soccer. And then we have you at Baxter Colburn and me at Simon Provan. Absolutely. A big show for you today. We're going to be talking about all things U.S. soccer. Uh, we might, well, we'll stray across the pond, but there's still U.S. soccer ties to it. So exactly. don't think that we're just completely all U.S. soccer today. But. We do talk about the beautiful game from an American perspective, so that's one of the reasons why we do what we do. So uh, the first thing we want to talk about, Simon, is a new coaching change that we, we both kind of figured and kind of called. Yeah, I, for... I give you credit. You're the one who actually called this one out. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So did yeah. somebody get that? <laughs> Anybody over there? An intern, maybe. Somebody write that down. Simon said I did something right. Yes. Wow. Well, we're talking about the, uh, the coaching change at New York City FC. Which, of course, we knew Kreese was already gone. Yes. But, uh, or Jesus Christ, as my, my wife right. thought we were talking about. <laughs> Jason Christ, Jesus Christ, basically the same thing. <laughs> Close, not quite. For Real Salt Lakes fans for yes, a while, they yes, thought it was. Yes, yes. Uh, but anyways, in New York, Patrick Vieira has been named the new head coach. Uh, curious about your feelings on this. Well, I think it's a good move from an organizational standpoint and saying the fact that, hey, we brought in a coach that has got some good exposure, not only as a player, but also with the under-23s with France as well. So he's had some good experience with those guys. But the only thing that worries me is, we've talked about this on the show before, is any time that you bring in a European coach into MLS, they always struggle. They never do well. We've had World Cup winners, as you mentioned, struggle. And now you bring another guy that's a seasoned veteran in all the right areas, except in MLS. And I feel like that's going to just come back to bite NYCFC in the butt again. One thing I'll say that maybe is a little bit different with him is that he he did uh, he was coaching the elite development squad for Manchester City. And mm-hmm. I know he did quite well with them. Yes, I believe maybe that even, was the twenty threes. I'm thinking right. maybe not France. Well, and I know he I, I believe he won a their Premier League title with that team, okay. I believe. So the one thing you can say with that is, okay, so he's been with the development team, and I do think MLS is obviously a step above that. 
But I'd hope so. He at least understands how to work with players that he can't just go out there and buy the most. He can't go out there and buy Messi to try to help him out. He can't go out there and you know even even buy a, a goalkeeper to help him out. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if perhaps that pedigree will actually help him then in MLS, having that understanding that no, we can't just open the pocketbook and. By anybody we and that's want. the thing I wonder the most about, though, when it comes to trying to figure out what he's going to be like as a coach, because as you mentioned, those other teams, he's had the opportunity to open the pocketbook and spend money that he's needed to. But when it actually comes to MLS and you talk about the collective bargaining agreements, you talk about all the other things that go into being a coach in MLS, there's so many different things that go into it. And I just feel like that at least for the first two months of the season, they're going to struggle significantly because of his unfamiliarity with that. I think so. I, I agree with you. The one thing I'm very curious about, though, Baxter, is now that now that he will be there, will uh, will Frank Lampard, will will David Villa, will Andrew, uh, Andre Pirlo, will they finally have respect for their manager? Well, I'm, uh, a, it, I'm a little surprised they weren't as respectful of Jason Christ. I mean, well, he's a very credible coach. Well, I think, you know, I take that back. I think Villa was. We saw that in, in his play. We saw that he trusted what was going on there. Yes, he trusted uh, the but, system. But certainly Lampard did not seem to trust what was going on, coming out and even talking against Jason Christ by saying to him, when Christ came out and said, we got players here that don't seem to really believe in what we're doing, you know, Lampard comes out and says, well, that's foolish. Of course we do. Uh, you leave that stuff in the locker room. You don't come out as a player. Exactly. I don't care what you're getting paid. Exactly. So will these players now have respect for their manager that, that perhaps they didn't have before or not as much? And will that help as well? That's the hard question. I don't know. I don't feel like I feel like New York is separated between now their elite head coach, their few good slash elite players, and then it's just everybody else that happens to be on the roster to make, you know, to fill out the rest of the positions on the field. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I do think I was I was listening to somebody else talk about this. You got to get all three DPs on the field to make them happy. Exactly. So so you have to find a formation that works for that. You know, is that a? It's not rocket a, science to put all three guys on the field. You if you, if you run maybe a four four two, you put Via up top at one of the forwards. That's what he's done so well. Sure. And you just put Pirlo and you put Lampard in the middle, two center or, mids or, or a three five two perhaps. Yeah. Exactly. There are multiple ways to get all three of those guys on the field at once. That doesn't make anybody upset. But see, the problem, here's, here's, the, here's the big problem, is that their defense was quite weak this season. It was terribly that's weak. That's what they have to shore up on. And I wonder what they're going to do with that, and I feel like Vieira is going to come in saying, oh, good, I have some money, I've got Manchester City in my back pocket that I can go buy all these defenders, and, well, yes and no. You can't exactly just go throw out millions of dollars to defenders and bring them over. There's right. a process. Right, There's exactly. an allocation exactly. order. Exactly. You know? Well, and you don't have... You don't have teams that find that attractive. Now, Portland's an exception. They brought in Ridgewell. They, you know, he's making $1.2, $1.1 million. Yeah. Dollars, but he's one. I th- I'm, Omar Gonzalez is no longer a, considered a DP. I think Ridgewell may be the only DP defender in the league. Isn't so Matt Beasler technically a DP, a DP defender? Too? Uh, he you're and right. Graham yes, Zussi yes, were given DP right. status yes. last year. I, so I'm probably talking way out there. But uh, for one of those guys who's really making... A ton of money. Mm. You know, these teams don't like to spend it on defenders because that doesn't sell. No, it doesn't. Know? That doesn't bring in the crowds. That's one thing to say, oh, we've got an elite defender. Well, that's great. Is his name Sergio Ramos or is it one of the top guys in the world? That would bring in crowds. Sure. People would want to, sure. I would pay money to go see Sergio Ramos play for an MLS team, but I'm not going to pay money to go see, no offense, Liam Ridgewell play. Sure. You know? Oh, I'm not. I, I mean, I'd, only, I'd go see Matt Beasler play because he's an MLS guy right. and he's gone through the U.S. national team system and all that, but... I'm not going to go to an NYCFC game to see Angelino play or some of the other guys that they've got on their back line. Sure. There's no reason for sure. it. Well, we're also at a point, though, where we're going to go to a game just to go to a game. Well, absolutely. You know? <laughs> if I get tickets to an MLS game, I'd go to a, I'd go to a, regardless. Right. I don't right. care who's playing. And I'm still a little bit surprised that Citigroup got rid of a guy who knows MLS better than the back of his hand, mm-hmm. Jason Christ. So I'm curious where, where he lands. I'm surprised he hasn't been snatched yet. Well... Maybe maybe offers been out there and he's kind of said not right now, yeah. or maybe he's wanting a little bit more money. Whatever it may be, I'm, I'm I wouldn't be surprised. I don't want to go too far into this because we'll we'll have a talk about this next week. But sure. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, well, I kind of wouldn't. I wouldn't be if we see uh, Siggy Schmid. Hmm? saying bye-bye to him, and, and then we see Jason Christ come in. That wouldn't be the worst idea for Seattle. We've talked about that. You've mentioned you'd like to see him out in Portland. I would be neither here nor there with him at uh, New England as well, but uh, you look at the teams that fired their coaches this year, and I have interims right now, but I feel like if we do get a Jason Christ new coaching job news in MLS sooner rather than later, 
I feel like we won't know about it until after the MLS Cup is over. I agree with you, yeah. I think that yeah. might be something that, oh, by the way, at halftime of the MLS Cup, Jason Christ has a new job. Like, I could see them breaking it at that point. Well, I'm almost, I'll tell you what, I'm almost surprised New York City didn't actually offer him some type of uh, position in their club. That's what I was thinking they were going to do. Just as kind of an advisor on, yeah. on how to work the MLS system. Because you you, you got to use the draft because it's it's one of your... The what? <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the super a, draft. What? That's a thing? <laughs> you got to use the super draft. You got to know how the salary budget works. Yeah. Um, you got to know how to find guys. You know, there was there was rumors that Christ was trying to bring in a Colombian, and Citigroup said no. Um, this goes back to our conversation last yeah. week about how he built RSL basically around Morales, and that's what he wanted to do. He that was a great player that. to build him around. Right, right. And that's, there was this player in Colombia that Christ wanted to go after, and Citigroup said no, we're... We're not Why letting not? you do that. Why not? So that right there makes me wonder, are they going to give Vieira any more power, or are they going to do the same thing to him? I think they're going to give Vieira plenty of power because Vieira is not going to go after MLS guys. He's not going to go after South American guys. He's going to go after proven European players that either have gone through the system that he's worked with, or maybe we'll see more guys actually from Man City get loaned over because they'll have that official tie. You know, I'm glad you said that because the one thing I'll say is so so they bring over the guy who's been in charge of the elite development squad at Manchester City. This, yes. It, it just proves to me even more that the City Group, they don't really care about what happens as far as on the field with NYCFC. No. It is, it's just become another development squad for them. It pretty much Manchester has. City. And let's be honest, how many players, no offense to MLS, how many players from NYCFC are going to get a call to Man City? Realistically. Right. Right now, none. No. But what I'm saying is... If they take that development league yeah. and say, all right, Patrick Vieira, take, name your seven best players that you right. want. We'll right. send them with you. Right. Imagine if Pierre shows up day one with you know seven to ten of his highly achieved de- development guys. You could be looking at a very, very good NYCFC team, but you could be looking at a very good... What and what Manchester City Group wants for NYCFC? Well, how could, many MLS you, players? How much? How much playing time is Patrick Mullins going to get on right, the field? Right, right. You know? And that's my point. Is right. You may you may see some good young players at NYCFC, but they're not there for the sake of NYCFC. No. They're there for the sake of Manchester City. So, exactly. so me calling them the baby blues just will keep continuing to happen. I have no problem with that. I've never did, honestly. I think it's just one of those things that you look at it from so many different angles and it all goes back to if it was literally any other ownership, anybody else, this would not be a conversation we're having right Absolutely. now. And that's why I'm so curious and so excited to see what happens with Minnesota United. I'm curious to see what happens with Atlanta. I'm curious to see when David Beckham finally gets his chips in a row. Like I want to know what's going to happen with those three teams, especially David Beckham, because he does have that European tie, but yes. he's got that MLS. Like yes. seven. he's he, got he like wants six years team. in MLS. He wants a team in MLS that will be that will be an MLS team. I can tell you that about David Beckham. He does. Tim Lewicki, by the way, who uh, was the main guy to get the Beckham rule into effect, which yep. obviously became known as the DP rule. Um, he came out and he's working with Beckham now. That's good on his group, and I, I give this guy a lot of credit because he came out and said, "Look, the number one people you have to blame for Beckham's group not having a stadium yet is Beckham's group." Mm-hmm. He said, "This is the worst kind of negotiation I've basically have ever this seen." This is ridiculous. There's no reason that any of this should be going on for longer than what has it been now? Almost two years. Oh, it's I, I don't even know anymore. But it's it's been ridiculously long, and and it just goes to show the the type of guy that Lewicki is, and that. Um, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, and he's not afraid to call a spade a spade, which is perfectly fine. You and and that's that. why Beckham brought him on board. Exactly. He's like, hey, I need a guy that's going to get stuff done, and we're not going to have any issues about trying to make this team move forward. And right. I get it. The stadium is one is the big thing. Once you get the stadium landscape, then you can put in all those millions and billions of dollars that go into it, and then they can move on from that. So you need to have a stadium, unless you're New York City FC. Exactly. Just honestly, at this point, just go play at the Miami Marlins place, or play in the Orange Bowl, or use the Dolphin Stadium. Just, no, I'm actually just do I'm, it. I'm all for them not having a team until they get a stadium down there. Oh, I'm yeah, I, I am it. too. And I think that's what I'm wondering, though, if at what point does David Beckham finally say, you know what, screw it, I've been playing this game for years, let's just stick it in somewhere else just to get the team on the ground, and then we can still do this whole, you know, actual Well, what I'm saying is, is, is Don Garber won't allow him that's true. to just play that at Marlins Stadium. He's, he said they have to have a stadium. But, you know... That was also at the same time where he said, hey, everybody's got to play by the same rules. And then huh. we find out a month later that New York City FC is getting a team anyways without a stadium. But uh, 
you know, we. But I digress. We, <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting here talking b- about Vieira. Uh, there was another coach that we talked about last week. There was. That's there was. building his poshness up as much as he can. Yeah, well, I think he's going to learn how to wave a white flag and surrender. And so just... I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised by this. Why? Uh, Why Mr. Bob surprised? Bradley uh, had qualified Stabek yeah. for the Europa League, mm-hmm. so he would have been the first American coach to coach a team in some type of European competition. Which is huge. Which is very huge, but he said goodbye to that, and he's now going to be coaching La Harve in Ligue 2 in France. Ligue 2, Ligue, yeah. or whatever, because it's Ligue 1, so Ligue 2. Right, right. So, I de, mean, Ligue 2. Ligue 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, the move, I think, is a good move for Bob. I think it gives him an opportunity to be around a higher quality level of player, and it's definitely a step for it is. Bob Bradley, and it also shows the fact that this is a team that thinks that they're going to want him to be around for a few years, because why bring in a guy to help you promote a team when you want to just keep him around for a year? Like They want him at least for two years to see what he can do this year, and hopefully the following season after, once they get promoted. Absolutely. Well, and, and they're in a good position right now. They're in fourth. Now, in the France leagues, they used to have three teams get promoted up to Ligue 1, mm-hmm. and three teams obviously relegated, but they switched it so it's only two and two. Mm. Uh, but La Harve interesting is sitting in fourth place right now, so they're not they're not too far off. So is so he taking over La, Far- La Harve effective immediately? Effective immediately. Wow. Sunday, I believe, is his first game. Um, is, there France, any, is there anybody like decent on the team that a normal not, person not, would know? Not that I not yeah. that I know of. Not great. Um, but it's it, it's interesting though, isn't it, that he had an opportunity to coach in a European competition, and he said no to that. At the same time, how great would it be for him to coach a team that he gets promoted to League Un? That would be so huge. The top division in France. That's that's one of the that's one of the best leagues right now in Europe. Yeah. Um, so what, where was I, where was I going with this? I don't uh, know. It's where also were you going it's with it's this? also the oldest team in France. So there's some history there, oh, which I think is kind of cool. I okay. Mean. Um, and, uh, you know, Bradley had mentioned that this club understands his own personal career path that mm-hmm. he wants to explore. So they understand that this may actually be just a stepping stone for him. But they're okay with that. They see w- how successful he was in Norway with Stabak. Yep. You know, he took a team to ninth place that the year before had just gotten promoted. And then, of course, this year gotten them all the way up to third place to qualify for Europa play. And now he's in France, and it would be something to see him take this team to, as I said, League Un, mm-hmm. and, you know, now he has an opportunity to get this league, or get the team in high, even higher in the league and, and set it up for success in the long run. And perhaps if he gets this team promoted, he will finally get the, <laughs> the due diligence from other European leagues that he's obviously looking for. I would think so. I, now, I'll, I'll ask you this. If he does get uh, Le Havre, as it, as it were, yes. promoted, and he does coach in League Un, and... A few years go by. Do we see him make a return to the national team? No. 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 I think his ambition is to coach club soccer, and I think it particularly he wants to end up in the Premier League. Interesting. Do you see him coaching anywhere else nationally? Oh, for other national teams? Yes. It's a good question. That is a good question. I mean, he's been he obviously he was successful with the U.S. He, they won the uh, they won their qualifying group. They did. They won their group at the World Cup. They did. That's of course, huge. they should have gotten past Ghana. They didn't. Um, took second place in Confederations Cup. So it's not like he did a bad job. He just he, in the World Cup there was a point where you know he should have been playing Edson Buttle. Edson Buttle had gone on a hot streak. Even yeah. the warm up game against Australia, Edson Buttle had scored two goals, and then all of a sudden he's not playing him. So he made mistakes like that. That I, I wonder if he's. He's obviously learned from those mistakes. I'd hope so, um, because he's been he's been so successful. You know, then he went over to Egypt, got them almost to the World Cup, lost in that final round again to Ghana. We've talked about this before. <laughs> um, I, w- with where he's at right now, I don't think he would want to. I think the only way he goes back to coaching a national team is if he gets let go. At a club team. Interesting. Okay. Well, that'll be something to keep an eye on, I feel like, as we go forward. I think he does have all the right tools. Like you mentioned, he's got the experience. But um, as you mentioned, though, I think his focus is on Lahar right now and getting them promoted, finishing out this season strong. They're still going to have 
probably almost three fourths of their season left. So he's going right. to be focused on that. And and in fact, he he he's, he'll be. Co- I said Sunday, but it's actually Saturday that he t- he will be coaching the club in their uh, French Cup game against Saint Omer. Okay, so Saint that'll be Domain. a good test for him. And I wonder when it comes to transfer season in January too, if he'll have a little extra cash now with it being a French team instead of a team over in Norway. Right. Give him an opportunity to maybe go out there and uh, bring in some guys. Yeah, we shall see what happens. It's, uh, it's I still think it's very exciting to see an American coach who actually a lot of Americans wanted gone from the national team yep. to uh, to be doing so successful otherwise. And to be getting fairly decent support across the nation as Absolutely, a whole. Absolutely, yes. I haven't really heard a lot of ill things muttered about Bob Bradley. No, the only time I hear Ill, Ill things muttered is from younger fans who basically really, well, I hate to say this, but don't understand what was going on yes. in that time period. No, I'd agree with you on that. And you know, I, he, I yeah, obviously, that. obviously, there is, there is, they were up on Brazil two zero in that Confederations Cup final, and they end up losing that three to two. They're up two nothing against Mexico in the Gold Cup. Mm. They end up losing that four to two. Yeah. So, so there is that, and of course, that's when he got fired. But um, you know, everybody thought that meant that a precedent was sent, but obviously, that doesn't mean a precedent was sent because now you can take fourth in a Gold Cup and still keep, and your, still job. keep your job. Absolutely, it's going to become the new norm. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what to say about that. All right, well, Simon, I think this would be a good time for us to transition into our show into the part that we call our fifty fifty segment. Uh, and the way our 50-50 segment works is that Simon and I take on a topic in the soccer world and uh, both take a side on it and offer our arguments about it for 45 seconds each, which makes 90 seconds, which equals a soccer match. And uh, we kind of hash it out from there. So uh, what is our topic this week, Simon? We're talking about uh, a new rule came out from U.S. soccer that kids 10 and under are no longer allowed to head the ball. So coaches have been uh, basically told, do not teach headers f- for those who are 10 and under. And then from 11 to 13, it can only be a limited amount. So you, you're limited in the amount of training you can do on headers. And then after that, you know, go for all broke if you if you want. Um, it comes out of actually a lawsuit U.S. Soccer was being sued for. I'm not exactly sure all of the details, but they were being sued by a group basically saying that by... By pushing the agenda with headers that they're putting more kids at risk for brain damage. And uh, so U.S. Soccer came out and said, you know what, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to outlaw headers being 10 and under and uh, limit it then when you're 11 to 13. And beyond that, the development perhaps of the brain is strong enough that headers are okay. So we're, we're talking, uh, we're, we're each taking a side on this. Is, is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Um, as Baxter said, we each get 45 seconds. One of us gets to talk without interruption for 45 seconds. Then we, somebody else takes the second half of the argument, basically. Absolutely. And, uh, so we base it off of the old soccer game of 90 minutes. We take it down to 90 seconds, 45 <laughs> seconds each. All right. Well, you went first last week. So I, I think it's only fair that I get to go first sure. this week. So uh, let's get a timer. Timer going. Up here, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm uh, ready to go You're when you set. are. All I right, am. Baxter, here we go. All right, well, I believe that this is one of the most ridiculous things that I've ever heard. I think that U.S. soccer is basically telling kids to take away a very crucial element of the game of soccer. Uh, when you talk about heading the ball, and I get it, they're trying to help protect kids and their brain development, but one of the things you need to look at immediately is that there is so many different forms of technology out there nowadays that can help protect kids, young and old, from possible header damages. The first one that comes up to my mind is a new soccer company that's come out recently. It's Storelli, and they have fantastic designed gear for uh, athletes and soccer players especially to help protect them. They've got different headgear and everything that can help protect these kids. You also talk about taking away header development. Look at Abby Wambach. She scored 77 goals from her head. You talk about that, it's hard to Time's really say. up. All right, so it's my turn now. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. And go. Actually, I don't mind this at all. Uh, I do have a vested interest in that I do have a daughter playing that I also coach. Um, Look, uh, a header in and of itself is not going to cause brain damage, but it can certainly lead to uh, brain damage or or even concussions. Uh, And the younger a kid is, the more even the structure of their skull is still developing. So I'm completely okay with this. We should be focusing anyways on foot skills at this point. Yes, Abby Wambach is great with her headers. Got a lot of players great with their headers. Uh, When kids get a little older, it's fine to start introducing the idea of how to head the ball. But at 10 and under, these kids are still learning how to cross the ball. So why are you spending time on teaching headers when there's really not many opportunities, if any, in a single game to head the ball? So concentrate on the foot skills. Worry about the head skills later. Time. So my question to you then, Simon, is... 
Is there going to be a yellow card issued if they use their head? <laughs> be like, you used your head, you're done, out of the that's game. A, like, that's a great question. And realistically, how often does a 10-year-old boy or girl have a ball fly towards them in the air, and they're going to be like, I'm going to use my head? Well, barely ever. That kind of backs up my argument, though. Yeah. So if, if no, those I know, balls aren't happening in games, why even Exactly. Why no, even I completely them? agree with you on that one. But also, from my angle, why bother outlaw? Because it barely happens. I got what you're saying. You know? Well, lawsuits. Truth. Litigation. Paris. Angry soccer That's moms. Why. Don't anger the soccer moms. All right, we're going to go to a break. A lot more to come with the U.S. and an award that was handed out to the wonderful women. They just keep women winning awards this year. We'll talk about it when we come back. Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn. And this is Simon Proban. Simon, it is time to talk about the national teams. Yes, it is. The national teams, and you could say that our men's team is all right, and our women's <laughs> team is glamorous, world-class, a gold medal standard. However you want to describe our women's national team, the United States Women's National Team was honored yet again in what has been just a storied year for them. Now, first, they won the w Women's World Cup in Canada, and they've continued to win. Uh, they won e the SB Team of the Year, and now they have a new, uh, I don't know if it's a trophy, but an award to award. add there to their, their, their case. Uh, they were awarded one of the Glamour Women of the Year Awards. Uh, every year, Glamour uh, gives out their Women of the Year Awards to eight different women that impact the world in a positive way and help change the, the way that we view everything and women as a whole. And the entire women's national team was honored last night, among other people like Viola Davis was um, talked about last night, um, Serena Williams was mentioned last night, Victoria Beckham. So they were in some very good company last sure night. Sure were. Yeah, and one of the reasons they won this award is uh, not just because of their achievement at the World Cup, but also their, their fight for equality. Of course, there was the, the threatening of a lawsuit um, in the fact that the women had to play all their matches on yeah. artificial turf. FIFA would never allow that for the men. Uh, you know, back and forth on that. Obviously, you've got leagues like MLS, like the Russian League, like uh, some of the Scandinavian leagues that yep. they all play on. The, all, all their teams have, not all their teams, you, can, you know what I'm saying. There's, yes. there's teams that have Turf. artificial fields. Yep. So, uh, but for the fact that, you know, you saw the, the World Cup winner for the women's walking away with a $2 million prize versus the U.S. men's team who made it to the quarterfinals walking away with, I think, 16 or $17 million. Really? Mm. There, there's something to say about that. Absolutely. Does, does the Men's World Cup bring in more money than the Women's World Cup? Of course it does. But you can't deny the fact that every time the Women's World Cup comes around in this country, mm -hmm. it's a big deal. It is. It's a huge deal. How many times do we see such a surge of women soccer players coming up after the World Cup as well that you know excel at the game and want to ride the, the coattails of how fantastic these women played? So... I've always been a strong advocate for equality for the women's team. I think that they deserve and are honestly probably better than the men's team on a lot of different facets. 
and the stability of it. And you can say that they've had many scandals with things with Hope Solo and when Pia Sunhagen left and Jill Ellis and Tom Stramani, but it hasn't been to the extent, I feel like, of where the men's have been. Like, the women, it's one thing to continuously get knocked out in, like, the first round of 16 by a, a small African nation, but it's another thing to make it to the World Cup and lose in penalty kicks. It's a little different. Right, right, and then go back right. and destroy that well, same team. Well, here's but to go off your comment, too, about the, the controversies that have happened in the U.S. women's team, they've persevered through them. They have. And right now we see a, a U.S. men's national team that the fans and, and it sounds like even some of the players are not quite sure what's going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, you got to give the women a lot of credit for that, you know, that... Well, I mean, let's face it, whatever the heck's going on with Hope Solo, whether she beat this or nephew or not, um, you know, that's going, that's going back to the courts. Yep. These women didn't let, let that affect their play. Exactly. And I find it interesting, too, not to just dwell on Hope Solo, but there were pictures of her with not a lot of clothes on that came out a while ago, too. That was a big thing. And then it was just kind of gone. Now, here's, here's the one thing I'll say, and I certainly don't want to bring any negative things into this. No. I... I personally don't think Hope Solo should be on the team anymore. Interesting. And this is why. Court case first got dismissed. Fine. You're not going to suspend her. They suspended her, but you're not going to kick her off the team for that. Fine. I understand that. Court of law said nothing happened. But when her and her husband yes. use one of the team vans and he gets pulled over and gets a DUI, yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's, now you're there's no the excuse team. for that. But at, at, to the same accord, too, if it was literally any other player on the team... We wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We'd be like, well, remember that one girl, Morgan Bryan? Well, she's gone now. You know, we don't care. Right. Well, but it's not. It's Hope Solo. It's the best goalkeeper in the world in the women's game. And such an sure. icon. But if you're fighting for equality. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It doesn't matter that's, who it is. That's where it wonders. It's yeah. like, well, at what cost? And we right. see this in the NFL. We see right. this in sports as a whole. And we could go on for hours about all of this craziness. But nevertheless, Hope Solo still turned in a fantastic, a world-class performance at the World Cup. She was a vital part to their success along with the team as a whole. And because of that, they were honored by Glamour as one of the women, quote-unquote, women of the year, right. being an entire team. But well, just a fantastic it, group of one ladies, One of the great though. things that you see from the women, though, too, is that they don't just highlight women's soccer. Because of their success, mm-hmm. there's been a, there was a nice spotlight on women's sports as a whole. Yes, and I think that's been great. I mean, it's even something as something like the WNBA as well. It doesn't get a lot of press. When those finals were going on, post uh, women's world cup there was a little extra publicity about it because it was women's sports and it was like oh look you guys should tune into this you should check it out and see what's going on so it was nice to see that women's sports as a whole are starting to get a little bit more airtime on national media as well absolutely so all right well flipping over from the women's side to the men's side uh there have been some new developments with the men's teams both young and old we're focusing more so on the old uh in terms of the uh roster that has been put together for the uh, November 13th through 17th uh, World Cup qualifier games. Uh, the U.S. men's national team will take on St. Vincent and the... I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> Grenadines? Grenadines. Grenadines. Uh, oh, yes. Don't yes. you put that in drinks? I think so. Or Grenadines? Cherries? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then they also play TNT as well, Trinidad and Tobago. So looking at this roster, Simon, uh, let's quickly walk through it. Josie Altador, your favorite player, Ventura Alvarado, Kyle Beckerman, Matt Beasler, Michael Bradley, Geoff Cameron, Mix Discarude, Alan Gordon, Brad Guzan, Bill Hamid, Tim Howard, Miguel Ibarra, Fabian Johnson, Jermaine Jones, Matt Miazga. 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 I got to work. We'll call him Matty M. Uh, Michael Orozco, Darlington Nagby, Jordan Morris, Breck Shea, Tim Ream, Bobby Wood, Jassy Zardis, and DeAndre Yedlin. Your thoughts, Simon? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very excited to see Nagby up there, not just because I'm a Timbers fan, but he, it's well-deserved. Uh, ever since Caleb Porter moved him from the wing into the middle of the field, mm-hmm. uh, Portland has really gotten things together, so it shows how he can control the middle of the field. Now, that being said, uh, I just have this, I have this inkling that Klinsman, if he brings Nagby in at all, which he will because he wants to cap tie him. I hope so. Uh, he'll play him out on the wing. I really... He's... He'll play him out on the ring. He wants to use his speed, though, and that's the thing. Darlington Nagmi, aside from his good technical yes, skills, I made his that. living off of his speed. I get that, but he's ineffective out on the wing. It's that's true. That's what scares me about it. But then that's the thing that you have to look at then. Well, that's great if you might try to put him out on the wing, but this team is also center mid-happy, though, too. You've got Kyle Beckerman, well, Michael okay. Bradley, Jermaine Jones. Let me cut you off there. Here's the thing that upsets me. Klinsman comes out and says, we have to, we have to get our youth infused in this team. Mm-hmm. They have to step up. Yes. All right? Then you bring in a guy like Kyle Beckerman. Yeah. He's done wonderful things sure. for the U.S. national team. He's had a good, yeah. But 
but it's time to put them aside. Exactly. Right? So you take you take this 32, 33-year-old out of there, and you put Darlington Nagby in there. Yeah. And but granted, will he, though? And granted, Beckerman is more, is more of a defensive mid, and, and Nagby's going to be more of that attacking mid. I hope so. But nevertheless, you know, you still have Jermaine Jones that you can play as uh, as a D yeah. mid. You've got Michael Bradley yeah. that you can play that you can pair well, up with. Michael Nagby. will be an attacker. I mean, Nagby, you could probably play a still a four four two or a four five one of sorts as well. But or when you're playing against a team like Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, you, you should can, just you go for the, the diamond. Box. Yeah, put the box in and just let it go. I mean, there's some players on this team that I think are going to benefit from this time up there. Uh, I'd like to see more from Miguel Ibarra. I thought he had a good coming on party, but he's kind of dwindled off. But he's looked really good. He's playing for Leon in yeah, Mexico, he is. and he's, he's done quite well there. Actually. It is, yeah. yeah. So um, U.S. Soccer, if you're listening, go and uh, change his bio because you still say he plays for Minnesota <laughs> United. So uh, little maybe things. that's wishful thinking. Wishful thinking, Minnesota. Yeah, there's a Minnesota United fan in the U.S. Soccer office. Like, <laughs> ah, he's still a still a guy. He's still a loon at heart. Listen, I I want to see. I actually I wouldn't mind seeing. A four four two with Bobby Wood up, up top. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to put in, if you want to put in Eltador, fine, go ahead. I think it's well, he time. Will. Yeah, he will. Um, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing actually a Bobby Wood, Jossi Zardes combination. And that's the thing that this roster is very forward heavy, which is fine. Which you would allude to the fact that maybe, maybe that Klinsman decides to go with more attacking options going forward. He's going to need to to keep up with the physical strength of TNT. Oh, absolutely. I mean, TOT is going to come out guns a-blazing, as they always do. Um, you know, so, I don't know. I, I, the other thing I, I wanted to make mention, Jonathan Brooks, you know, Klinsman came out and said he hasn't called him up because he hasn't been playing in Germany. Ironically, Brooks went for the full 90 minutes this last weekend in the Bundesliga. Yeah. Uh, but then he brings up Ventura Alvarado, who I don't know a single person who says, hey, great, Alvarado's on the roster again. No, nobody uh, he, ever says a thing. Even when he first came on the roster, I think maybe a few people of us were like, okay, let's see what he does. But after a game or two, it's like, you can Well, and my him. biggest point is is that he's not been playing down in Mexico. No, he's he not for Club America, but he, he's not actually But he's not playing. been playing. So, again, it's that double standard that we see. Uh, with Klinsman. Mm-hmm. No, your, I agree. Your thoughts on it. Your, I've been sharing a lot of money. No, no, that's thoughts. fine. I mean, looking at this roster as a whole, I think it's nice to see some consistency on the back line. Jeff Cameron's, whether or not they all play, it's the fact that the same consistent guys are being pulled in, which is good because then they can develop that chemistry with however they play. Matt Beasler, Jeff Cameron, those guys coming in are going to be just fine. Uh, it'll be interesting to see um, Matty M there from the New York Red Bulls to see him get some time as well. Uh, I do want to see... What happens with Breck Shea? I do think that he is nearing the end of his time with the U.S. men's national team because he's been struggling with injuries. But I want to see what he can do with this team. If he do, if they do play him at left back, what he does there. If they play him at outside left mid, what he does there. I think he's been a fantastic guy. That's why Kyle Laren credited him to his Rookie of the Year award this year. So I think he was like, Breck Shea helped me really develop. So Breck is one of those guys that can really work with some of these younger guys. Um, I would. I really want to see Zardis and Bobby Wood uh, get some solid playing time, though, and Jordan Morris. Jordan as well. Morris as well. I forgot that he was on there. Actually, that's. I think that's what I would like to see. It's tough because Jordan Morris is more like that number nine player. He is. You know, you play him up there alone. Um, at the same time, he surprises us with his speed once in a while, and, and that's why I think he needs to be on the field. More. Right. You know, do you play a Bobby Wood and Jordan Morris or a Giassi Zardis? If there's Jordan a way Morris? to use all three of them at the same time, I, one of the and this is so not realistic, but what I do on FIFA all the time when I play is I play with two forwards and then I play with a center attacking mid or a center forward. Sure. So I play like a, almost a triangle attacking forward. You could use Jordan Morris as that center forward, possibly, and then use the speed of Zardes and Wood up top and have those guys be finishers. Perhaps this gives Klinsman the opportunity to go back to trying a 4-3-3 as well. That That's what he possible. really wanted to use yeah. when he first came, and it just wasn't working. But, you you know, you put Yedlin on the right, yep. Shea on the left, uh, center mid. I think you still keep a Michael Bradley at center mid just yep. for that. Consistency. Bradley will stay there. Maybe, probably Jones will start. Jones or well, now let's be honest. Beckerman will start. Right. Yeah, he will. He will. So that'll be your four midfielders right there, and then your three forwards. Uh, maybe, probably Josie will probably start. I think Zardes will start because I think Klinsman started. To, I think Klinsman likes Zardes because right. he right. wouldn't keep calling him if he didn't like him. No. What, here's what I would like to see ultimately, though. Um, as far as speaking midfielders as well, I think Dax McCarty deserves a call up. He's been playing fantastic for well, the we've New been York talking, Red Bulls. Americans have been calling for Dax McCarty for years, yes, yes, years uh, and years and years. And again, if you're talking about youth, 
I don't think Jermaine Jones is going to be there for 2018. He won't. Again, wonderful. No. I mean, that goal he scored against Portugal in the World Cup was, oh, it was fantastic. Beautiful, but that's also that was, that'll be his He's, last World Cup. Clint Dempsey won't be at the next World Cup. Clint Dempsey won't be there. Uh, but you know, the other thing with Jones, too, he just seems to have the injury bug. He, he seems to get he injured quite a bit. His future's up in the air as far as club ball is concerned. Um, so, you know, why not bring in a guy like Dax McCarty? Exactly. You know, we know the fail Haber bus is not going to happen. You know, that train <laughs> No, we station. can jump that one. Um, but my question to you then, Simon, is what do you do with Mixed Discrude and Alan Gordon? Well, you use them as subs. Obviously, but uh, you, do they belong on a long-term U.S. national team roster? Uh, I think Mix possibly. Alan Gordon, no. No. Then why bother with Alan Gordon continuing well, to come I, up then? Well, I agree with all of this. You know, the um, uh, Wondolowski, thank, thankfully, has not been called up. But uh, in games like this, you know what? Get get rid of some of the old guys. Yeah. They actually do bring in the younger guys. And nothing. this is nothing against Tim Howard, but Tim Howard, 90% sure that he won't be in Russia. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I, I and honestly if he, even don't if, agree even with if that. He, even if he is there, I think Brad will start. You think so? I think so. Well, we do, what we do know for sure is that Klinsman did come out and say that he's going to be rotating them. Yes, for the near which future. Is, which is fine. Right, That's right. fine because he's trying to break is Tim it, back though? into it. Is it, is, it, is it fine or do you just say, Guzan's my starter? Because one of the things Klinsman keeps preaching that it's impossible for him to actually put out there because he keeps changing things is the team needs consistency. I agree with that, but it's a different situation when it's Tim Howard because Tim Howard willingly took a year off after the World Cup. So now he wants to integrate him, even though he's been playing fine with Everton mm-hmm. and everything's been going great with them. But I think he wants to integrate Tim Howard back into the lineup because he knows of how much success he's had at the international level when sure. Tim Howard has been his goalkeeper. Because if he just tosses him in straight, then they're going to suffer completely again. But by rotating him matches with Brad and Tim, I think that works out overall through these first few qualifying games. And then going forward, Klinsman can say, all right, Tim's my goalie, Brad's my goalie, and then can just go with it. Yeah, I just don't know if... The rotation of every other game is really the ideal thing. So what I'm saying is play one or the other for mm-hmm. these first two set of games. I agree. Then when the next couple of set of games come around, give that to the next guy. Mm. Or honestly assess them in practice and make one guy your starter. It's hard to do that, too, I feel like, because it's one thing to take shots in practice from Josie Altador, but it's another thing to take shots from... It's a good point. Any other player on any other international team. It's a good point. You know, if you and I are on the same team and you're my goalie and I'm shooting at you, well, yeah, you're going to know what it's like to play goalie against me and you're going to do whatever you need to do. But if you get another guy off the street that comes in that's shooting at you, you're not going to know. I, me as a coach, I'm not going to know what you're capable of doing against him. So you're going to have to give him that opportunity to showcase what he can do. So aside from that, though, looking at this roster, Simon, is there anything else that jumps out at you, though? Uh, anything that jumps out at me, I'm just I'm happy to see Miazga there as well. He's mm-hmm. been another fantastic player by the Red Bulls. I don't know if this guy will be in MLS next year. I've I've got a really? feeling he'll be sold. Oh, I really do. He's been he's been that powerful. Uh, the Polish national team was looking to bring him in as well. well I hope um, that I hope that. Well, if he plays though, then he's then he's, he's cap tied. So right, that's which what... again I think that is a smart move. I don't give them a lot of credit uh, often on the show, but I give Klinsman <laughs> credit for bringing in Miazga. If anything, just to get him cap tied. But I also think he's got a great future with the U.S. national team if he plays as strong for the national team Mm -hmm. as he does for the Red Bulls. I'd agree with you on that one. So a lot of different ways that we could look at this roster, a lot of different things we could hash out. Let us know your thoughts about this roster. You can get at us on Twitter at 2 up front soccer at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan. Yeah, one last thing, too. I'm, I'm glad to see... Klinsman finally got over some personal stuff and actually called back a player that he had a problem with in Fabian Johnson. He's been doing fantastic for Borussia Mönchengladbach in the Bundesliga. So Klinsman, thumbs up. I'm bringing Fabian Johnson because he is one of the best players on the team. All right, well, we're going to step aside. When we come back, we're going to flip over to Major League Soccer and take a look at some of the crazy uh, semifinal legs for the Western and Eastern Conference. We'll be right back with more here on 2 Up Front.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn. This is Simon Provan. A reminder for all of you wonderful soccer lovers out there, if you love listening to Simon and I on a weekly basis, you can get us right on Sports Radio America from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Live 365 and TuneIn and SportsRadioAmerica.com. You can also get us on demand on iHeartRadio, iTunes, and on Spreaker.com as well. All right, Simon, looking at Major League Soccer, Whew. MLS... How you feeling? After oh, what a fun con- Sunday! Those conference semifinals had everybody sweating. I feel like second legs they they tend to be games that can be pretty boring, especially if the team who first played at home is now on the road. They sit there and bunker. Yep. We didn't see, from what I saw, anyways. We didn't see any of that happening on Sunday in all four games. You know, I was. Little leery of man, am I really going to be able to watch all four games? Well, the answer is no. I didn't get to watch all four you games more than in, I did. in entirety. Okay, uh, but I got to watch quite a bit of it. That's good. And uh, you know the the first game had me a little worried. New York and DC. It was snoozer. it was a bit of a snoozer at first. Um, for the first oh I don't know eighty five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Uh, but it wasn't because any team was bunkering. They were just they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and uh, and finally. Uh, things things got taken care of by the New York Red Bulls. They, they did. BWP, they, yep, doing what he's done so well the last few years. Scored a goal. So he did score a goal. He scored a late goal in the uh, in stoppage time. The basically the ninety second minute of the game um, wasn't needed because it was clear that New York was going to yep. walk away. A Good winner insurance of the policy though. But, it helped yeah, start the party a little early. Gave them a two zero aggregate over DC United. Uh, I don't know. What I do you make of DC United season then? As a whole, what do I make of it? I think uh, I think they had a very early start that gave them false hope, mm. and it's a good thing they had that early start because it got them into the playoffs. I'm more concerned about next year for them. Is Perry Kitchen going to be there? Is he also going to be sold off? It's true. Um, Is Ben Olsen going to be there? They've got a lot of older players. They if anything, a very old squad. You're looking at once again a rebuilding year for DC next year. So yeah, yeah. Is, is Ben Olsen going to be there? I don't know because. Um, he certainly hasn't proven to be the man to lead a team from a rebuilding phase into any type of contender. I'd agree with you on that one. You're looking even at that starting lineup. Bobby Boswell, really old. Uh, Chris Ralph, pretty darn old. Nick DeLeon, getting towards old. Fabian Espindola, old. Alvaro Salvario, old. I mean, you can go down the line and just look at all the guys they've got on that team. They've got a very old squad. Bill Hamid's one of the younger guys on the team, but... Uh, you know, it's it was one of those things where New York outshot DC eighteen to ten. They looked like they they just looked like the better team as a whole, honestly. And I'm I'm glad that New York won because it's starting. It's continuing to make you and I look smart because right. we both picked the Red Bulls. Right. But it was all New York though. Look I'm, at that uh, possession stats. So 61. sixty one, yeah. sixty two, basically to thirty eight. How crazy! Ridiculous! Ridiculous! What it is? Duels won. New York 78, D.C. 45. I, I just mean, think the way that D.C. United went into this playoffs were like, you know what, if we win, great. If not, no big deal. Like, even when they played New England, I wasn't thrilled by how D.C. won. Because when I found out, when D.C. won the game, I was like, they didn't really play better than New England. Right. They didn't really play better. And then the way I saw them play against the Red Bulls in the first game, I was like, this D.C. United team doesn't want to be in this playoffs. They just don't want to be here. And they looked atrocious. And then we saw them again. No, I mean, they touched the ball for 38% of the game. Right. How do you right. want to win an MLS Cup touching the ball well, and I, But I also think that says, too, uh, a lot about the Red Bulls and how they dominate. Oh, and, yeah. And how well Jesse, Jesse, uh, Jesse Marsh, I Jesse can't speak. Marsh. Jesse, Jesse <laughs> Marsh. <laughs> I'm done. See you later. All right, see ya. Jesse Marsh is who he was looking for. The name yes. you look for. We'll yes. call him JM. I mean, how well oiled of a machine that uh, he's got that team, you know, yes. from all the way all the way in the back from uh, Robles, Robles, Robles. I never noticed uh, that. All the way up, all the way up to Bradley Wright Phillips. Of course, you got Question, Dax McCarty, who we mentioned earlier in the show in the middle of the field. So, I don't know if anybody's really going to be able to stop the New York Red Bulls. Mm, at least not in the Eastern Conference. We'll see about when it gets to the MLS Cup. Uh, looking at the other game, though, in the Eastern Conference, we talked that it might be the Montreal Impact that would make a surprise trip to the conference finals, and it looked like it for a while. It did. It they, they did. did. They were up 2-1 to one against the Columbus crew uh, after leg one, mm-hmm. and then um, Columbus decided to say enough is enough. Kai Kamara got the party started early, scored in the fourth minute, Dilly Duca scored in the 40th minute to make it uh, 3-2 on aggregate. Right. And then Ethan Finley and Kai Kamara took the game into their own hands. They did. Well, Ethan Finley got them in the 77th minute to tie the aggregate up yep. because now they both had an away goal. 
And Kai Kamara doing what he does best, proving that he deserves to be. I tell you what, Giovinco, did he have the best, uh, statistically best um, year in MLS ever? Yeah, he did. Um, But where's Toronto in the playoffs? Yeah. At, at home. On and, the and where's Columbus? Uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals. And who scored the game-winning goal? Uh, the series-winning goal? I'll take uh, Kai Kamara for 500. So, you know, there was there was a couple of weeks there where Kamara wasn't doing anything. No, and but still, he's peaked at the right time. So right. Sebastian Giovinco, he had an opportunity to do it as well. He didn't peak. He didn't do it when he needed to. And you go back and look at the payrolls again. You yeah. Know? Yeah, this is, you know. How does Columbus crew, realistically? How are they where they are without the, with the limited amount of money they've got? Right. You know, and of course, you do have... You've got Will Trapp. You've got Ethan Finley playing outstanding. Fantastic. You talk about players that need to be called up to the national bingo. team. Bingo. Yeah, that's a oh. valid bingo. That's a very And big then, of course, you've got Kamara up top, who uh, he's been doing it all year long. Um, but you look at the money, again, that Toronto has spent. Uh, Giovinco has Michael Bradley. He has Josie Altador. He's got – maybe he doesn't have much in, in the way of other players. But Not really, no. I, I can't exactly say that Columbus lives and dies by Kamara. No. But – they in, live and die. Case, they live and die by their midfield, which right, is Will Trapp right. and Ethan Finley. And then you need a striker who's going to finish off the opportunities. Which is Kamara, right, and he does yep. absolutely. And then occasionally we'll see uh, Higuain jump in there also and do some pretty talented things as well. Hector Jimenez is also a very good player. Aaron Schoenfield, Jack Mack. Don't forget Jack Mack's on this right, team too. Right. But so a good team though. Yeah. Well, it was it was interesting that DDA Drogba had a decent game. I mean, he went all 120 minutes. Uh, four shots on goal, um, but couldn't put any of them away. No. For the outstanding finish he had to the season and the beginning of the playoffs, it was interesting to see not him uh, to see him not be able to get a goal in this yep. last game and, and maybe seal things up for them. Yep. I did find it interesting, though. I thought it was a great moment um, after I'm Facebook friends with Kai Kamara. Whoop, shout out. I think he's <laughs> Facebook friends with everybody that friends request him. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he had a picture on his Facebook uh, of him and um, Drogba. Uh, just together, like after the game. So I thought that was a really nice touch that they, he was basically comment or complimenting Drogba for everything that you know he had done for the game, and also just complimented him as a person. Also, so it was nice to see a mutual respect. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah, that's that's one thing about Drogba. You know, you saw earlier in the year that he went to one of the impact development practices and just uh, went in the locker room and started dancing with the, yep. the kids. You know, he's, um, I think he's a kid at heart in a good way. Like yes. we've seen him have some controversial moments, like leg gate, where he was holding uh, the the keeper's leg against uh, against Columbus. Sure, but it's not like he's been spitting on players. No, or, exactly. You know. He's a good guy that's out there that knows he's towards the end of his career, but he's having fun with it. You know? Right. And so, I feel like that could be kind of how Andre Pirlo w- could be if he let loose a right, little bit. But right. Andre's very... <laughs> you know, very, very relaxed, somber guy, the most interesting man in the world. What's interesting, speaking of that, is uh, I was listening to a, a talk show earlier today, and they were talking about Italian soccer. Mm. Uh, the question was asked, does anybody bring up the fact of how well Giovinco's playing in MLS that maybe a Serie A club would want him back? Mm. And uh, the gentleman who was speaking said, actually, no. All we ever hear about is Pirlo. That's thought, true. Wow. But, I mean, between those two, who would you rather have on your team? I'd rather have Giovinco. Right. From a longevity perspective, exactly. You know, I mean, Pirlo, he'll he'll keep playing until he's a hundred years old. Oh yeah, and you he know, will he's fantastic. Still, he'll still look the, exactly the same too. But, which but is great. you know, it'd be nice to see him care a little bit more. I I agree. I think York. so much of what he does do as a player is just kind of a all right. There it is. There's your forty yard ball on a dime. Yes. Now I'm gonna yes. trot around. Yep. Jay, yep. whatever. It's like okay, bud. A little bit more. A little bit more. All right, um, so looking at the Western Conference, Simon, wrapping things up here, what do you got? Oh, craziness in, in Dallas. Oh, baby, what a game. And uh, so we're looking at Seattle coming to this game. Uh, they were up, correct? They were up 2-1. to 2-1. One. to one. So Dallas did get that very important away goal. They did. And after watching that first game, you know, I had tweeted out there that Gonzalez had the game of his life. And it was unfortunate that they lost, but I still feel that FC Dallas is going to take this uh, because of the speed of Fabian Castillo yep. and because of the great play by Gonzalez, this 20-year-old. He plays for the U-20 Mexican national team. Huge player. What a fantastic... I mean, he, this was only his 11th MLS start, and here he is making two saves in the penalty kick shootout that ensued at the end of the that game. Was, they were great saves. He, like, all ball. Like, he got both hands on the ball. Right. Good shots. And it was, that's the thing, too. It's not like uh, Seattle's players were putting in puffballs no. to him. He was <laughs> they were hard, low-driven shots that he Every part of his 6'2 on. frame stretched out and, and saved those. But this was a game that was already exciting, even though goals weren't being scored. Mm-hmm. 
It looks like Seattle's going to head down to Dallas, and it looks like they're going to walk away with the win. Then Teshel Akindali ends up scoring, right? So now we're even on the aggregate, 2-2. Yep. Chad Marshall then, just six minutes later, goes in and scores for Seattle. Now you're th- and my wife was laughing at me because uh, I, I'm, of course, actually, I can tell you, FC Dallas was my first MLS team. That's right. right. Because That's uh, right. I was That's down right. in Texas yep. and blah, 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 blah. Um, so I was excited for that. But I'll also admit, especially if Chris Blakely's li- listening to the show, that <laughs> I was cheering against Seattle. No yeah, lie. What are you going to do? Um, I was too. So when Akindeli scored that goal, I start going crazy. And my wife goes, what? what What game are you watching? And then actually my oldest daughter runs up and goes, did Portland score? I said, no, I'm not <laughs> watching Portland play. <laughs> <laughs> and she just they goes, know though. That's good. You've got them trained well. <laughs> right, that they know. Right. So she's like, "Wait, wh- what's? It's is it the U.S. team? No, it's <laughs> not the U.S. team." I had them all confused in my house. Anyway, like, what's going on? <laughs> so then Chad Marshall scores, and I'm going, "Oh my goodness! Of course, of course, Seattle's going to take this." But then Walker Zimmerman, 91st minute, we're in stoppage time. I don't even think it was a minute actually after Chad Marshall scored that Zimmerman ends up putting in the goal. Now we're tied on aggregate. I had tweeted out, look at Dallas is ahead, and Chris yep. Blakely, of course, quickly corrected me, and I realized in my excitement I forgot that Seattle had that away goal. Ends up going into extra time, which, of course, nobody scores, and then we go into a PK shootout Ooh, where man. Gonzalez did his magic. He did, and it was a fantastic game to see. And I, I honestly thought, I was like, you know how this is going to work is that Seattle's going to win. I just I had it in my heart going into it saying, as badly as I want FC Dallas to win this game, Seattle is going to find a way to win. It's going to be Clint Dempsey or Ivan Schitz or Martins or somebody that's going to score that goal. And they're going to go through and they're going to win. And then they're going to go to the conference championship and yada, yada, yada. But thankfully, and well done to Walker Zimmerman had himself a fantastic game. Oh, he did. And has been loud. He ended up scoring not only the game the game tying goal, but then the game winning penalty kick as right. well. So. And man, I got to tell you, it was impressive to see him score that goal. Then he just turns around and has that stoic face. Yeah. Like, Dude, you just won the game for yeah. FC Dallas, and you know, finally loosened up after his players uh, came running out there. But what a what a great oh, what man. a great moment for him! It was a fantastic moment. I'm so glad that he was the one that was able to be a part of that. So, and then Simon, let's flip it over. Your the final game, your Portland the Timbers. I'll be honest, I was a little bored by the game for most of it. I was like, all right, they drew zero zero in the first leg, second leg. And I'm like, still zero zero, still zero zero, still zero zero, and then. Two goals. Two goals. And, I, you know, I, for me, of course, it's the Timbers. So I was excited. It's, of course. It's the playoffs. They weren't in the playoffs last year. They've been on a tremendous run. <clears throat> Excuse me. They've been on a tremendous run for a few weeks now. Uh, let's face it, Vancouver, the first 15 minutes, I thought they, they had more control of the game. Mm-hmm. Kwarsi gets lucky with, uh, with Mana having a Kekuda Mana for Vancouver taking a shot that bounces off the post hits Kowarski in the back of his head, uh, Portland's keeper, and then bounces out of bounds. I yeah. thought for sure that ball was going to go back in. But the turning point of this game truly was Mana going down with either a twisted ankle or whatever it was. It was, it was uh, the turf monster got him. <laughs> After he goes out, I'll tell you what, Portland just decided to finally take over and do what they do best. And, of course, Adi, as he's been doing the last few weeks, what a Puts good goal. In the game winner. And it was ironic, too, oh. because the commentators were saying, you know, be like, yeah, we haven't seen much from Fernando Adi yet. Like, but wait for it. You know, he'll pick his opportune moment to score. And then, like, a second later, it was like, boom. And they're like, and there it is from Adi. And, and as you like, said, what a goal. I mean, it just, just slammed it home right, 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 right inside the box near the top of the 18. Perfectly placed, as you said. Yep. And that was in the 31st minute, so it's the first half. And then... Uh, Insurance goal doesn't come till the 94th minute, but Diego Chara, who's also been a man that's been struggling a bit with getting some goals in there. And uh, injury also. Uh, that's right, right. Um, and, but that, that also was assisted by Adi. So talk about a great game for, for a single player, Fernando Adi, doing it for Portland. That's true. I'd have to say if we were doing power rankings right now with the remaining four teams, I'd have to say Portland's number one. You would? I would say that. I, I think would, they're riding the biggest wave right now. I would, I would put FC Dallas up there myself, to okay. be honest with you. I think, honestly, Columbus and New York would go 3-4. I'd go the other way. New York 3, Columbus 4. Hmm. Fair enough. All right. Well, there we our, go. There's our impromptu <laughs> power rankings. We're going to take a break and come back to wrap things up with our I Believe. Don't go anywhere on 2 Up Front.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn. This is Simon Provan. All right, Simon, before we kick off for the day, or sub off, or give our final farewell as the TIFO raises in the distance and we give our final clap to the fans, whatever soccer pun for a game finishing up that you want to say, we uh, want to do our favorite segment of the show. <laughs> So it is our I Believe segment. The way that works is Simon and I both offer I Believe statements about something that we feel will happen in the soccer world. Uh, for instance, I believe that Donald Trump will buy a, a Major League Soccer team. I don't know. It's just what I felt like <laughs> going with. That's not what's yeah, actually my He I was believe. talking about buying one in Colombia. He was. So. He was. He was. I Maybe wrote, he wants to get in the drug cartel. Wrote an, oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe that's how his campaign's being funded. Anyway, I wrote an article about that. All right. So, uh, Simon, I'll let you go first, sir. Yeah, I'm, act- I'm changing mine on the fly. So sure. So most people are going to be listening to this on Friday, but it is Wednesday. It is Veterans Day. So I believe that I am very thankful for my grandfather who fought in World War II, my father who fought in Vietnam, and my father-in-law who fought in Vietnam as well. I believe that because of them, we have the freedoms that we have, and I just want to throw out a special thank you to Mm. them. Absolutely. Thank you to all of you veterans. Happy Veterans Day to all of you. I have a few uh, relatives as well that uh, either were or are in the service as well, so special thanks to all of you. I do have a quick history thing for you. Please. My my grandfather was actually at Pearl Harbor when it got bombed. Was he really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. His best friend got... I shouldn't talk too much. I'll start crying, but his best friend... Uh, shot down right in front of him mm. on the day that Pearl Harbor got attacked. So. My goodness. But he survived, thankfully, which is uh, what made my life possible. I was going to say, I was like, you're here, so <laughs> that's, thank you. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, but thank you to all the veterans. And for those of you who are serving, we've got a buddy that steps in once in a while, Brad Castriva. He's in the reserve, so thank you, Brad, for your service. And, and all of you who have served or are serving, uh, we can't thank you enough. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, I, my I Believe segment is on a little bit lighter note. Um, I believe that Darlington Nagby will have uh, a very good performance for the U.S. men's national team. I think that he will step up. I think Klinsman will give him the opportunity to showcase his abilities, and he will take that chance and run with it. I think there's a big opportunity here, a big turning point for the U.S. national team with the young players that have been called in. I'd like to see more called in, uh, but I truly hope that Klinsman means it when he says... It's a new era. I do. I agree with you on that one. All right. Well, this has been another edition of Two Up Front presented by Sports Radio America. Remember, you can listen to us right here on Sports Radio America from 3 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on SportsRadioAmerica.com, Live 365, and tune in. And you can get us on demand on iHeartRadio, iTunes, and on Spreaker.com as well. And we're on Facebook at uh, Two Up Front. Twitter, we are at Two Up Front Soccer. He is at Baxter Colburn. I am at Simon Provan. Instagram is at 2UpFrontSoccer as well. With our manager being the one above, we are 2UpFront.